basically doing business in our day and age a lot of the models are changing there was a interesting article that came out about two to three weeks ago that talked about the fact that you've got uber which is the biggest cab company in the world and they don't own a single cab you've got alibaba which is the biggest retailer in the world almost three billion dollar 300 billion dollar valuation and they don't hold a single item of inventory You've got Airbnb, which is the biggest accommodation provider in the world, and they don't own a single property. And basically, the mantra or the, the rule of the story I got from reading that was, the business models are changing. And if anything, I think they're becoming more African because they're effectively saying the infrastructure is commoditized. You can't compete on the asset. Owning the asset is not your competitive advantage anymore. It's how you get your product to your customer and how you provide service to your customer that actually provides you with the competitive advantage. So with that in mind, we looked at it and said, okay, fine. We've got a product called Drybath. It's a fast moving goods company uh, product. So it's a retail brand. How do we build a huge retail brand without owning a single factory? That's essentially the challenge that we've got. We don't want to have to raise the capital expenditure to do that, although I'm a firm believer that South Africans should be investing in industrialization. I plan to sell the business, so that's why I don't see the point in investing in a factory. All right, so effectively on this slide, it was an interesting graph that The Economist had actually issued two weeks ago, talking about how WhatsApp was actually now, there were more WhatsApps being sent than SMSs. And I included a quote from two years ago, two to three years ago, by the MTN CEO. This is before WhatsApp was even acquired for $19 billion. And they were saying, what do you guys think of WhatsApp? And his comment is basically, well, these text companies are eating into our SMS revenues. They're making them stale. When I look at that and I say, you are the CEO of the biggest cellular company in the world, why didn't you guys start WhatsApp? That's, that's literally the logic that I'm trying to get to you today. The point is, the guys running the old companies, the huge conglomerates that are now listed that run the world, they're doomed to be killed by you guys coming up with your idea to revolutionize the whole model. And it's up to them whether or not they try to listen to you. And that's the thing I always tell them when I engage with them is, who's your youngest friend? And you're only as strong as the youngest friend you have. So the older your friends are, and in most cases, they always say they are the youngest amongst their friends. And I say, well, you're doomed because it's going to be late for you. The whole talk today is supposed to be centered around how to take an idea and actually turn it into a business. Now, with my personal journey, I started wanting to become an entrepreneur at the age of about 15, 16, when I was in the ninth grade. Um, the first idea came when I was watching Top Gear and they were making their own fuel. And I thought to myself, geez, you can make your own petrol. This was before green fuels were popular and South Africa even had a green mandate. So I went and I did a whole lot of research around biodiesel, ethanol fuels, which one is the optimal one to use, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think about three months into working on the idea, having found ingredients, I had chosen that I was going to do biodiesel and the reason for me choosing biodiesel was because it was the most commercializable one. So as in, if I developed biodiesel, you could literally adjust frying oil. So old used frying oil, easy adjustment to it, and you can use it as a biodiesel fuel for your engine. And the funny thing is it cleans your engine. It actually makes your engine perform better, although the fuel economy is much lower. So you don't get as much distance for your fuel as, other, as petrol would give you. So after having chosen biodiesel and put in all this time, um, I went and I learned that a company called De Beers Fuels had just gotten 50 million rand from the government to basically distribute and develop biodiesel in South Africa. And these guys were going to use a whole franchise model and the stock that they were going to use was algae. So they were going to use algae as the feedstock. Now, being in Limpopo, rural roads, um, Electricity and the water, basically as unpredictable as the weather. So one day you've got water, one day you've got electricity, the next day you don't. I realized that I won't have the resources necessary to compete with these guys. So I had to let the, the idea go. So that first important lesson for me was you haven't really failed if you weren't able to chase it completely the way someone else would have chased it completely. So you need to choose your competition wisely. 
So a lot of the same thing happened with all the other ideas I came up with in high school. So this ranges from trying to invent a healthy cigarette. Um, this happened as I was coming home from school, got into a taxi, guy came and sat next to me, started smoking, and I thought, hey, I'm getting secondhand smoke and I'm not being paid for this, so something's wrong in the world. And I had to figure out a way to fix it. So I went home and I started thinking about all the different leaves that I could use as an alternative to tobacco. So this was probably in late grade nine. I looked at tobacco itself, if there was anything similar that I could find, nothing. Then I looked at marijuana, but it was not legal yet. So I said, okay, pause. And then after that, I decided to look at uh, tea. So I thought about when we were kids, whenever we could find any dry leaf in the yard, you'd basically just crush it, put it in a roll of paper, and then pretend it was cigarettes. So I thought, hey, what actually does happen when you smoke that stuff? So I looked at tea specifically, and I figured out, I figured out that when you smoke tea, the caffeine inside the tea behaves very similarly to how nicotine behaves. So I wanted to use the tea fannings, the stuff that you find in your tea bags, they call them tea fannings. And that's actually the lowest quality part of your tea. That's the stuff they sell to you in a tea bag. The best quality part of the tea is the leaf itself, the full tea leaf, that's where the flavor is. And that's quite expensive. So anyway, I did all, a whole bunch of research and I went through what I call inventor's syndrome. So when you first come up with an idea and you think it's so valuable that somebody's gonna steal it, you can't tell anyone about it, and nothing ends up happening because you never told anyone about it. So the one thing I've learned through my many years working with people and discussing their ideas and everything else is that the more intellectual capital you're able to get behind your idea, the more valuable it becomes. And it's never about the idea that you came up with, it's about the team that you're working with. So I would rather take a good team, an excellent executing team with a bad idea over a shit team with a good idea. So the most important thing for you to work on as an entrepreneur and as if you start a business and you're actually working, even when you're working inside companies, you learn that it's the people that are the most important thing. It sounds like a cliche, but I'm telling you now, it is the most important thing. Having people you can trust, having people you can work with, having people who share the same the same values or the same dream or vision that you have, that's the toughest part of starting any business. And I can tell you this because I literally ran my business on my own till I was in third year. So for six years, I was running as a one-man operation. And I'll tell you now that I'd probably be a billionaire by now if I had a good team with me from day one. So anyway, um, a whole bunch of ideas pan through. So the cigarette idea, um, I went and created some prototypes. So I went and took some tea fannings and I rolled them up. And because I wasn't a smoker, but I knew smokers from school, when I got to school, I told a whole bunch of guys that smoked and said, you know what, if you guys can try out my cigarette, I'll buy you a real cigarette. And then you guys give me feedback on whether or not my cigarette is any good. Uh, they all said it was crap and that they'd never buy it and I must just stop. Um, but then I didn't give up that easily. Um, at this point, I had learned a whole lot about patents, how to patent, the difference between a provisional patent and a complete patent, how much each costs, what the whole process is, PTC patent when you're going global. And the idea basically fell apart because I ended up trying to patent the idea. And the patent search revealed that someone had already patented the idea in 1991 when I was one years old. It was an American and it basically wasn't a novel idea. They had patented the use of tea leaves as an alternative to tobacco leaves. Now, some other people would have been like, ah, quit, don't try again. But the way I saw it was, oh, I wasn't that crazy. Somebody in the States went and spent 50,000 rands or 70,000 rands protecting an idea like this. So clearly, I'm on the right track with all these ideas. So I had already accepted that I'm probably going to fail. I was in the middle of Limpopo. Dreams of making a million in a year were basically nonsensical. Although I still believe they could happen, I was healthy enough to understand that it probably wouldn't. Therefore, I just kept going. Um, and then eventually, um, something really important that I learned during that year was doing your research. So in order to do the patent, in South Africa, to file a provisional patent costs 75 rand if you write the patent up yourself. 
but in order to do a patent search, so for an attorney to search if somebody has already protected that idea, it costs 3,000 rands for them to do that. And they're able to do it because they've got access to certain databases that you don't have access to. So being a little kid in Limpopo at the time, I literally just went on Google. I found a law firm that I could find online. It was specifically Smith and Van Veek attorneys. They're based in Pretoria. And I chose them specifically because the partner's emails were on the website. So I could just send them an email. So I literally sent an email to this guy. He's, he's one of the partners. His name was Carl Smith. And I said, Carl, this is my story. This is who I am. This is what I'm working on. This is the healthy cigarette I've developed. This is what I've, I've researched about the market and what the market does. I don't have the money or the resources to do this patent search. Can you help me out? And that guy decided to help me out. We've never met. Till this day, seven years later, I've never met Carl. I spoke to him four years, no, actually not even four years ago, three years ago. He sent me an email because his law firm was trying to get the patent for dry bath. I think somebody was trying to find out what we protected and what they could copy. But essentially, to this day, I get a lot of emails from young people saying, please mentor me, please help me, please, etc., etc." And I noticed that there's a huge difference, even with me at that age, was that I evidenced the amount of work I had put in. There's no money. There's no money anyone could have paid me to show the amount of work that I had put into the idea. And that's how I think you earn the respect or the help that you seek to get from other people. And I always say that the research that you do is actually what leads you on to who you need for help. So you sending me an email just saying, Lure, please mentor me, etc., help me. I'm not necessarily the best person to help you with that idea. But because you didn't do your research, you could have spent that time coming to me saying, this is where I am. This is the type of person I need. Do you know someone like that that you could refer me to? Easily help you out with that. But I can't figure out your problem for you. That's one thing, no matter who you ask for help, whether you're asking a CEO for help, a lawyer, an accountant for free help, you need to know exactly what it is that you need from them and figure out a way to give them value back. So essentially, that's the most important lesson I learned from the healthy cigarette idea. Um, grade 10 hit, I was bored again. The cigarette idea didn't pan out. I needed way more money than what it, what it required to make it a success. Then Mixit was getting popular. Everybody was on Mixit. Kids were getting kidnapped. And I thought to myself, hmm, a lot of parents are complaining that they don't know what their kids are discussing on these platforms. So maybe they need a dictionary. I mean, back then, parents didn't even know what BRB means. So I thought maybe if we actually created a dictionary for these guys and sold it to them, we could make money off this. So I went on the web and I invented some of my own abbreviations. In total, we had about 3,000 definitions for text language. And then I went about basically collating all these into one document and then sending it to a whole bunch of publishing houses in South Africa to see if they'd publish me. Now, it didn't really work out. They weren't interested. They didn't pick up the book. They didn't think the book made sense for them. Then after that, I saw that that wasn't working out. I tried publishing it with cell phone networks. So when you buy your SIM card, you'd get a little dictionary pack inside your SIM card pack that gave you all these definitions. I tried calling them, basically got nowhere, mainly because you don't know the right person to contact. Um, and then eventually, I was like, OK, I need to break even on this. Otherwise, all these business ideas are just costing me money. So I went and I printed a whole couple of copies. I made it look nice. And I sold them for 20 bucks a copy at school. I managed to sell 20 copies, so I broke even first time. It's a completely different feeling. Um, so yeah, basically, in school, they'll teach you what break even means. Life will teach you how break even feels. It's two different things. So anyway, um, so that idea also basically fell apart. Um, I also tried to publish a magazine, a security magazine. Crime was getting really bad by the time I was late in grade 10, this was 2007, no, no, 2007, 2005. Crime was getting really bad. A lot of the women in my family are police women, ironically, and they always get a magazine that's called Police Magazine, and it details all the different operations that they ran, how they worked, if they worked, etc., etc. And I thought, hey, damn it, why doesn't this get published to the whole country? Then people would know that the police are doing something about crime. This was my most expensive idea, as in it took all my pocket money. 
Um, my budget at the time was about 50 rand a week that I got from my mom. That was my pocket money. And if I could convince her to give me a little bit more money, I'd get another 50 rand. So M MTN's midnight uh, shift and all these MTN zone discounts, they were saving my ass. That's the only way I was still able to afford dating while trying to work on all these different ideas. And then eventually the magazine idea also fell apart, but then I still have an obsession with the media industry. So I learned a lot about media in South Africa, media buying, media agencies, advertising agencies, how those different organizations work together, how much money is spent on advertising in South Africa. At the time it was 24 billion rand spent to get your attention. That's literally someone selling your attention and you're not getting paid a cent of that. So I'm, I'm obsessed with that. I'm still going to crack that business model. But then eventually up until grade 11, that's when the idea for Dry Bath came about. A lot of people still don't believe me, but I say that the idea came out of a simple conversation with a friend of mine who did not want to bath. So he literally said, why doesn't somebody invent something that you can just put on your skin and you don't need to bath. And the reason that idea resonated with me is because growing up in Limpopo, we used the bucket bathing method. So you boil water in a kettle, we didn't even have a geezer, you boil water in a kettle, you add some cold water into the bowl, you wash yourself, the water gets so soapy that you can't rinse the soap off your body, you're on your knees, which is not a good position to be in in any condition. And Basically, it's, it's just not a great experience. Now imagine that whole experience in winter. It just gets 10 times worse. So when he came up with the idea, I was just thinking, okay, I hate bathing, and this would actually solve my problem, because the problem with not bathing is that you smell, so I get rid of body odor. I thought the thing existed initially. I didn't think I'd have to invent it. I thought I'd just have to find it, and then import it, and then sell it in South Africa. So when I got back and I did my research, um, remember that my biggest tool at the time was this Nokia 6234. I don't know if you remember this phone, it's so loud. Yes, it's Nokia really invested in the sound there. Hey? It was a really, really loud phone. Um, and it had the most important feature, and most people don't get it. The thing about this phone was that it had copy paste. And if it did not have copy paste, I don't know what would have happened with dry bath or if I'd even be sitting here today. But the importance was that when I did my research for the dry bath product, I used this phone to basically research gels, lotions, hand sanitizers, how they work, melting points, toxicity levels, all these different things. So in high school, I did nine subjects. I didn't want to choose when they tried to knock us down to seven. I told them that I wanted to do both the science and the commerce subjects. So I had a basic understanding of the science behind it. Um, took about six months researching all these different ingredients, how each ingredient behaved, what was wrong and what was good about each ingredient. And then eventually I wrote down the formula on a piece of paper and it was like, yeah, you know, if you mix these things up, you've got something that you can put on your body and you don't have to bath. And initially I came up with an idea. I still went through inventor syndrome. So you remember inventor syndrome? So I had to protect the idea. So because of the experience I had with the healthy cigarette and what I learned about patents and what was required, I actually had the knowledge to write my patent document myself. And lo and behold, even though it was two years later, I still called Carol up and I said, Carol, you know, the cigarette idea died, but now I'm trying to get people not to bath. What do you think? And he's like, hey, same old crazy ideas. Let's talk. Then I sent him the patent document and said, look, I don't want you to draft it for me. I've drafted it myself, it was about eight pages, and just tell me if it protects me enough to be a good provisional. And he got back and he said, look, you've done a great job with this. For someone your age who doesn't even have engineering experience or even uh, legal experience, you've done a pretty good document. You can go ahead and file it. Um, and then dealing with CPRO as a nightmare, um, they're now called the CIPC, a nightmare. Um, all my airtime gone calling those guys over and over again. It's like, you know, you're calling these guys. Yeah, I sent the document. Yeah, yeah, it's there. I don't even know what I thought CIPC buildings looked like, but then these guys were just making my life a living hell. So eventually the paperwork got filed and I thought, hey, you came up with the idea, write the business plan in matric and get funding and you can run with this idea. I wrote the whole business plan on a piece of, on, in my book and then I showed it to my mom and then my mom said it's untidy, write it again. And then I wrote it all over again neatly, 
And then after that, I had to capture the business plan on my cell phone. I couldn't use SMS, so I used MMS. So SMS has 160 characters. And if you press send by mistake, that's a whole lot of airtime gone. So MMS allows you to write up to 1,000 characters, and it has multiple pages. And I didn't even know this. So I was like, that's how much I used MMS, that I even learned that it's got pages that you can put in. It's not just one text. So anyway, I wrote the whole business plan, 8,000 words, 40 pages, wrote it on the cell phone, copy-pasted it to the Gmail app, emailed it to myself, saved up enough money to use the internet cafe, which was 20 rand an hour. So I saved up enough money to use the internet cafe, put the, do word document in, uh, put the words into a word document, made it look pretty, and the business plan said I needed a million rand, and the models were there, I did accounting, so everything made sense, and I was like, ah, who'd be dumb enough not to give me this money? We're gonna get rich now. <laughs> so I went and I sent uh, this email, the proposal out to a whole bunch of funding agencies, local, global, IDC, NYDA, all these guys. Half of them didn't even bother replying back to me. Um, some of them got back to me, and I've gone on in life to actually meet them um, later on in life, and it's always quite ironic because I'm like, hey, remember? Um, and then basically, the feedback I got was I was too young, the idea wouldn't work, people want to bath, and that I was crazy to think someone would give me a million rand. So that basically fell apart. Um, came to UCT, was lucky enough to get the Alan Gray Orbis scholarship. Um, and people don't get this, it was actually my first formal interview. So the process is you fill in an application form, they call you in for an interview. My first formal interview at this university, all the way from Limpopo, I pitch up there wearing my sneakers, my jeans, my cap face backwards, my hoodie, and I walk in and these guys are all wearing their school uniforms and they're looking formal and no one told me any better but I still got the scholarship. So yeah, so I think it worked out. It worked out well. So anyway, um, got the scholarship, came to UCT, actually came to UCT by mistake. My first preference was actually University of Pretoria because I wanted to major in entrepreneurship and accounting, but they didn't give me a res, and UCT gave me a res, and I didn't want to live at home. So that worked out, got here, and I need you guys to understand something. This is now two years, and I still haven't touched Drybon. It's a thought in my head. Finally, I got a laptop in first year, so I was always with my laptop working on my business plan every single moment, going to the InvestSoc events, going to the BMF events, sitting in the back working on this business plan document. And in the first year, we entered our first business plan competition. It was the National Innovation Competition. We won 20,000 rands, we came third at UCT. It being a government-run competition, we got paid a year later. Um, and we got the money in second year. Finally, we had enough money to make the prototype. So now this is three years after. We finally have enough money. We found Dr. Henny Duplessis, who had actually invented this little sachet, the Easy Snap sachet. So he was tired of tomato sauce sachets and wanted something you could snap in half and it's got a tiny little hole where the gel comes out. He uses it for food, personal care products, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So effectively, we made the prototype uh, gel in second year. I put it on my skin, it felt good. Didn't really have a scent to it, seemed like it, it looked fine. But then as we were driving home from the factory, I realized that my skin started flaking. And I was like, okay, this is not going to work. Then we went back and spoke to Henny. Henny is a PhD in chemistry. He used to work for Arms Corps building bombs and rockets. So he's a genuine rocket scientist. And then in 1990, the year I was born, he quit and decided to go make sonar gel for pregnant women because the one in the market wasn't working effectively and his wife was pregnant. Um, so yeah, then he just stayed in the industry. So when you go to Clix and you see some of their personal, their private label products, so the Clix labeled lotions and all those things, Henny is the guy who formulated a lot of those gels. So we went to Henny and said, Henny, you've got the experience. You kind of like the idea because you also didn't like bathing when you grew up. So can we do a partnership and you take care of all the development? And he said, yeah, he's keen to come on board. And I gave him a quarter of the business and we've been partners since then. And effectively, he now makes dry bath the best bath substituting gel on the market. Now, there were some key lessons that we learned along the journey of commercializing dry bath. So this is a very important graph, uh, Paul Graham's startup curve. 
So you come up with an idea, you get excited, oh my God, it's a great idea, we're gonna make money, and then real life hits, and you realize just how much work and effort it actually takes to get the idea off the ground, and you go towards what we call the crash of ineptitude. That's right at the end there. So what you need to understand is entrepreneurship is a lot like science. So I've always wanted to be a, sci a scientist um, when I was growing up. Entrepreneurship is a lot like science. You've got a hunch, you've got a suspicion that something has certain value and that someone will pay a certain amount of money for it. And you have to go out and experiment to prove your hunch or to verify if your hunch is true. So literally, don't look at it as I started a business and it failed. It's I've got an idea and I'm going to experiment with it and change it and adjust it the way it needs to be adjusted to actually make it work. So when we started out as Drabath, we literally went to everyone. Everyone thought I was crazy. A lot of my friends still thought I was crazy. I'd say, guys, it's a bath substituting gel. You put it on your body. You don't need to bath. It saves water. It's good for the environment. But people weren't buying it. We were getting a lot of PR. Um, we had learned that business plan competitions were an easy way to fund the business. So we entered a whole lot of business plan competitions. Over the past four to five years, we probably raised a million rand just from business plan competitions. So we've never had to take anyone's money or get a loan. And effectively, what we learned was a lot of people liked the idea, but a lot of people were not seeing the value in the product. The first people to actually use dry bath were actually Western markets. So America and Europe were our first major customers. And they buy each sachet at 30 rand a pop. 30 rand for a bath. We initially went there saying five rand, and they said, Cool idea, but mm, no ways. Where is this thing made? We said Africa, and they said, no ways. I'm not going to buy it. It's too cheap. That was actually what they said. It was too cheap. So we had to figure out why did they say it was too cheap. We figured out that the customers value their bath according to a certain amount. So an American says, if I had to pay every single day for my bath, I'd be willing to pay $4, 3 to $4, that's 30 to 40 rand for my bath. So anything that's substituting my bath needs to be 30 to 40 rand. So we went and said, okay, 30 rand, and they started buying it. Locally, um, when I was in third year, so balancing school and the business was getting extremely tough. I think I missed two months of school. I wasn't even in the country. Um, I failed my first course, Manic 2, bloody busted. Um, but luckily, I still kept my scholarship throughout all the years. And effectively, by the end of third year, I was cons considering dropping out. So what a lot of people didn't know, including the Alan Gray Orbis Foundation, was my plan day one was that I would drop out. But it wasn't to drop out because dropping out was cool. It's because my goal was I wanted to make a billion by 25. And I think I was quite mature in my approach because I understood that to make a billion and to run a business that's making more than a billion, you can't be at school. There's not a single CEO that I know who stayed in school. Zuckerberg dropped out, Bill Gates dropped out, not because it was cool, but because the business required them to leave. So I always knew it in my head that if the business grew fast enough, I wasn't going to finish my degree. So when third year came and the business was demanding my attention and school was demanding my attention and I had little to no energy left, it was so terrible. I'd talk to my friends at school and say, guys, I'm not coping, I'm struggling. And everyone would be like, no, Ludwig, you're Ludwig, you sort it out. I mean, you're fine, you know, you're covered. Everything is fine with you. So people around you aren't able to understand or help you. But it was actually my business partner, a friend of mine who went on to become my business partner, who said, Ludwig, it's not about the idea. Remember what I told you about? It's not about the idea. Drybath was a pretty good idea. We're getting a lot of traction, but it's not about the idea. If this thing fails in two, three years' time, and you want to work on something else, and you live in a country like South Africa where kids are striking just because they can't get money to study. And you've got the money to study, someone's willing to pay for you to go back to school, and worst case scenario, you don't leave with your business science degree, you leave with a BCom degree, management studies, you still got your degree. Your three years wasn't wasted. So effectively, I decided to finish off school. Fourth year was hell. I was literally just skating through. Um, I don't know how I managed my 65% average for all the four years, but I managed it, which was like goal number one. In first year, I was like, you know, if I graduate with honors, I'm happy to leave UCT with honors. So I always had that in my head that as long as I'm getting 60% and above, I'm good. I've paid my school fees. Scholarship is happy. 
I just need to focus on the business. So I think we need to wrap up now and go into Q&A if you guys want to ask questions. But before I go there quickly, let me just explain what Dry Bath is for those of you who are still wondering. So Dry Bath is a bath substituting gel. It's a gel that you put on your skin and as you rub it on, it removes the dead skin cells and it removes full body odor. And the reason why full body odor is the biggest and most important thing for you feeling clean is because if I came to you on the street and I said, what makes you feel clean? What do you need to feel clean? You'd say, I need water, I need soap, I need all these things. Now, let's play a quick thought experiment. If you had a choice between two ways of staying clean for the rest of your life, option one, the most luxurious shower that you can imagine, as in there's a magical hand that just appears from the back that just rubs your back, and the shower head pulsates, and you've got all these great scents that just makes you feel like you're in heaven. But there's one thing about that. It never removes full body odor. So that's option number one. You've got full, all the massaging and hydrotherapy you could ever imagine, but it doesn't get rid of body odor. Option number two, the bucket bathing method. So you have to boil water with a kettle every morning to wash yourself, but it gets rid of full body odor. If you had to choose between one of those two for the rest of your life, which one would it be? And we did this experiment and found that at least 70% of people say they'd rather take the bucket bath. And it's not to say water is not important or that the hydration is not important. It's just to show you that most of the time you're bathing because you're scared of stinking, not because you need to get underwater. And the ironic thing is the research is actually showing us that bathing every day or even twice a day is actually terrible for your skin. It's ironic that you're actually supposed to bathe with just warm water, no soap. That's the best way to clean your skin. After two weeks, your skin gets back to its normal balance. But because the marketing companies, the consumer marketing companies tell you you need to use Protex soap, which kills the germs on your skin, which aren't really even there, it dries out your skin. And then what do they do? They sell you the triple extra moisturizing lotion that's going to repair all the damage that they've just caused. And I always tell a lot of people, in closing, that think about your great-grandmother, someone who lived in the early 1920s when you still have that black and white photo. She probably had better skin than most of your friends. And she didn't have to spend 300 bucks or 500 bucks on gels to make her skin glow. It was because she had the most natural way of keeping her skin clean. The people who invented your bath, the Europeans and the French people, now skip a bath two to three times a week. How long is it going to take for it to click here that bathing is actually not something you're supposed to be doing every day? Thank you.